Welcome back, everybody. We're thrilled to have you with us once again. Hard to believe we were saying before we started that this is chapter eight, reading comprehension among English learners. We're so excited to have Dr. Elsa Cardenas Hagen with us once again this evening. Um, also joining me are my colleagues, uh, Amy Cavalier and Lisa Bola. Um, I'm Dr. Pam Kastner. I do have the honor of serving as Patent State Lead for Literacy. Uh, we're keeping Colleen Redabu, if I got that right, who is to yeah. lead our chapter uh, this evening. Um, she's had a family emergency, so we're very fortunate to have Dr. Cardenas Hagen uh, leading us in chapter eight this evening. So I will turn it over to her. Thank you so much, and thanks for joining uh, in chapter eight. And I, uh, I will keep Colleen and her uh, family in our uh, prayers. And so as we uh, think about, and I said, well, I got to know my stuff. You got to know what's in the book. So of course I can, uh, you know, we, I didn't want to cancel this evening. I wanted to go ahead and meet with you and, uh, you know, just kind of uh, talk to you about uh, this wonderful, the ultimate goal of reading is comprehension, isn't it? And as many people will say, well, you know, you're sometimes I've been called a phonicator and like, <laughs> that you're only into phonics, right? But of course, when we work with English learners, of course, we know the ultimate goal is comprehension. And it is so essential because why do we do all those foundational skills, uh, right? Those foundational skills are to get us you know, really to the point of having, you know, deep, deep understanding. And a lot of times for the English learners, you know, uh, I think some of you mentioned, well, uh, when we were doing the chapter on reading fluency, you mentioned, well, I think, um, I think, you know, uh, English learners can read fluently, but they have trouble with comprehension. And a lot of times we do see that as a pattern that uh, oftentimes they can learn the structure of the language rather well, unless of course they have some reading difficulties in those areas, but they get those foundational skills, but we need to make sure that all the while that we're working on those foundational skills that we are addressing once again for the English learners, all, it's all gonna be about um, their language skills, their oral language proficiency and having that capability of, you know, how do I become an active and strategic reader? What am I supposed to be doing? And, and so the best practices, we're gonna talk about the best practices and we'll talk about best practices of what we know, uh, you know, for monolingual English speakers, but we also wanna talk about the work, you know, done for, um, you know, uh, these students who are also uh, English learners. And I added just like a, you know, just because I started, you know, thinking about the message tonight. And I said, you know, I have kind of like an easy little thing that I do, and I should just go ahead and share that. It's not in the book. It's in another kind of book chapter that I've written, but it just can make your life so much. I mean, and I think it just makes your mind, your life easier because you can put everything together and, and really think about a framework for yourselves as you're thinking about how to design, you know, effective, you know, strategies as you're working on comprehension and what are all the things you have to think about. And so I have, you know, an acronym that I use to help me to know how to organize myself to make sure that I'm covering all those evidence-based practices that we know of today. And, uh, and then we'll continue to work and, and know better how to get, you know, to these, you know, really high, high uh, levels. All right. So I'm going to, um, I thought I was gonna share my screen, but now I don't see my, <clears throat> here it is, chapter eight. Okay, so I'm gonna share a screen and I believe um, you probably um, received um, this, um, let me see, gotta get this out of the way. Yes, it's on the Padlet. Um, and I just put the link in the chat also. Thank you. Okay, so we know that uh, we're, we really want to get to these key components of literacy and tonight's, um, you know, Colleen is Colleen Redaboo's chapter and um, I'll be um, helping to facilitate this chapter this evening. And so as we think about uh, reading comprehension and as we think about, you know, what do, what do good readers do? Uh, you know, good readers, what they do is they can read text, you know, accurately, they can read them fluency and they have enough, 
you know, background knowledge, enough um, world knowledge and lived experiences, enough vocabulary. And also they have these cognitive strategies about, you know, um, you know, putting problem solving and reasoning and inferencing and putting two and two together, right? And, you know, what's very interesting when you, uh, if you have students who, uh, there's been studies that have done, like when you have students who are typically developing readers and those that are not atypical and not developing and struggling with reading. And if you tell them, you know, I'm really going to be uh, focused on what you're understanding, you know, so, you know, re let's read it for that understanding. And, uh, you know, I'm going to be asking you some questions about that. And we're going to have discussions and what have you that good readers, what they'll do is they'll actually slow the reading down just a bit to really focus and use some strategies to understand the text. But readers who struggle and may have learning disabilities, they won't change their strategy so much. So they have to be explicitly taught. And for our English learners, you know, we want them to understand uh, from the text and we want them to, uh, you know, to know um, you know, exactly what a monolingual English speaker would know and get to that deep understanding. So we need them to have high levels of understanding. Um, but also we must consider that if they're not getting to those high levels of understanding, is it because perhaps, you know, that vocabulary and that underdeveloped, you know, oral language proficiency in that second language, you know, could that also be contributing um, to the reading comprehension issues uh, that we see. So the basis for effective reading comprehension, and as I said, you know, um, the studies, the national studies uh, really have uh, began um, in the late 90s with our English learners at Science of Reading, including reading comprehension. And so now it's been, you know, more than two decades of looking um, at this populations of students and, and really trying to determine, um, you know, what, what needs to be done. And so when we think about that, uh, we want to think about reading comprehension and English learners, and what do we as educators, you know, what should we uh, be doing? Um, and so what we, you remember that National Literacy Panel Report that we've talked about quite often during this book study. And, uh, you know, in the book study, you know, we talked about how the National Reading Panel and we, you know, brought that in when we talked about phonologic awareness and when we spoke of phonics and we spoke of fluency. But now we're speaking about, and, and vocabulary, now we're speaking about that comprehension. And as we um, think about that National Reading Panel report is saying, you know, well, we know how important it is uh, for our students to be able to uh, understand the story structure and be able to take uh, the content and be able to summarize um, and be able to um, not only do that, but also uh, we know some of the strategies that can assist um, the students. So for English learners, we're going to have to adjust and adapt our instruction based upon every student that we serve, but especially the students who are English learners. And as you're working on reading comprehension, what we know is you're going to be needing to always embed that oral language opportunity in very intentional ways. And of course, the higher level skills of written language, which you'll hear about in a few weeks. So it's always important. What do we know about reading comprehension amongst English learners? That we have to build that language proficiency while building these literacy skills, while building numeracy, and while building content knowledge. So all across the content areas, including reading and language arts, we have to be building that oral language um, because that will assist us in achieving you know, great knowledge and great learning across the content areas. All right. So what we've learned and what you've heard us talk about like this whole time is that we know that for these students to be uh, successful, uh, we know that we have to uh, think about that primary language. And we've had these discussions when we talked about phonological awareness and phonics and how to bring in, you know, the native language to um, to really learning. But what we know um, is that using a student's primary language to preview, 
to introduce new vocabulary and concepts prior to their instruction in English. So in other words, uh, you know, how much do I know about this English learner? How much do I know about, uh, you know, what, what they know or what could potentially, what could potentially be, um, you know, be the issues uh, with them? So uh, what we know is, for example, when they have to read texts from the different content areas, right? That, you know, the informational expository text, that often has very conceptually dense uh, requirements. And we need to help to make those purposeful connections and build that background knowledge, teach it even before they begin uh, the lesson and begin to read about that. And so in addition to that, we want to, you know, work on, you know, the strategies that we know could potentially help them. So what strategies could help them to understand the text better? Well, are there some opportunities within the text that can help, like, for example, the use of cognates? And what I like to say is, you know, words in the English language, for example, words that have four and five syllables and are very fancy words are probably Latin based. We use fancy words, right? Uh, and so uh, oftentimes those words are cognates and, and we use, uh, you know, fancy words. And I'll, I'll just give you uh, an example. So in our language, like for example, in the Spanish language, we use the word placate in our everyday language, right? And you don't use that in the English. That's not a typical word you would use, you know, placate. And so we use that, we use the word placate to describe calm or calm down, right? Um, and so I think that's very, very important to understand that there's going to be a lot of, of different, um, you know, words there that are going to be cognates. And oftentimes when you use those cognates, it's going to be easy for the English learners. Um, and then when we're thinking about you know, how, you know, remember we talked about, I, I talked about, well, they need multiple opportunities for really understanding words. So as we think about vocabulary to get us to the comprehension, we have to make it meaningful. And we have to make sure that it's directly and explicitly taught. And how are we going to create those opportunities? And certainly do wide reading, those are opportunities. But what other opportunities do we have perhaps in, you know, our oral discourse, you know, perhaps in listening and then, of course, in speaking and, of course, in reading, but also in uh, writing. So we want to make sure uh, to give those opportunities. So for our students, we know that, um, you know, it's, they will need that explicit instruction. Uh, we know that, um, you know, vocabulary sometimes of text might have sayings in there, or um, for example, I just think about, you know, Black Friday, you know, what does that mean exactly? Did you ever experience that uh, in your home country or in your community? Uh, I know what Black Friday is because I participate in that, right? But is that something that is uh, typically um, uh, created? And then the other thing I want to let you know is sometimes we have different concepts for, and I like to talk about, we have different concepts uh, for maybe particular words that are used in the English language. And I give the example oftentimes of the of a word such as egg you know when you hear that word egg e-g-g -G, right um what do you think about um perhaps you're thinking about that is um you know something that um you know i have for breakfast and i eat eggs for breakfast uh and then but I have other experiences with eggs. So pretty soon in the springtime, we will have we will have eggs. And um, during the Easter holiday, we fill the eggs with uh, we get the shells and we fill them with confetti. And we have our Easter egg hunt, and then we crack those eggs on everyone's heads, and then the confetti's all over the place. Uh, so that would be a different experience with that word egg. Or I think about my grandmother who would use the egg and she would, you know, um, put it under our bed in water. And that was to cure us of the evil eye, curar del ojo, ¿verdad? 
Uh, and so, you know, so there's a very simple word in the English language, but my experiences and perhaps your experiences, perhaps you have other experiences with those words, um, we have a different framework, a different lived experience. And so it's exploring these kinds of things um, with our students and asking them and engaging um, in, you know, these rich discussions. So when we think about the explicit instruction and we think about what would be effective for that. Well, first of all, uh, I want to make sure that I understand, you know, what's the task at hand, what potentially in in these, um, you know, in this uh, text that they're going to read, um, how can I make that clear and meaningful? How can I engage uh, students? And so what we know is when students engage with each other, so that cooperative learning, you read about that in the National Reading Panel Report, you read about it in the National Literacy Panel Report, we also have it in some of our reports that we've written on what's effective for English learners. So when they when they get to work with each other and work collaboratively and talk to each other, that really helps to develop um, that, you know, explicit instruction and more opportunities for use of language and for and for getting to that deep literacy. But for our students, we also want to have routines. And that's why later in just a little bit, I'll be sharing with you some of the routines that I use when I work with um, English learners on how I make sure that I'm incorporating these best practices. We know th um, that, that summarizing a text um, it really uh, will really tells us about, you know, when a student is able to summarize that text, it tells us a, a lot about what they're understanding and, and we give those um, practices, right, for our students. So I think that's going to be uh, very important. So in the chapter, you have these principles of effective instruction. It's on uh, that page uh, 150 as we look at that. Um, but all of these are just, I mean, they work for everybody, don't they? Don't they also work for monolingual? Of course. But for the English learner, they need to know what's their language objective and what's their content objective. Because remember, you're always working on language with these students while you're working across the content areas. And I'm going to tell you, in one of our studies, it took us eight weeks to get our teachers to understand how to write and how to figure out the language objective with the content objective. And so that was a, you know, an eye opener for me that it's not as natural to think about what are your targets for language while you're working in the content areas, right? Uh, and so that's very clear what you need for the English learner, their language objective, plus the content objective. And, and so that's really getting to, hmm, what's the purpose? What am I gonna be learning here? And what should I be thinking about? And you know, what are my goals? Uh, and so can they reach those goals through those classroom and language uh, routines? Absolutely. And how am I gonna help them you know, to build that uh, vocabulary? Shall we stop right there for just a moment? I don't wanna just talk, talk, talk to you. So, um, so far on the principles of effective um, you know, is there anything, any comments or anything that anybody would like to add? Okay, so yeah. We do have um, a comment from Linda. Um, in my experience, ESL students are discouraged from speaking their language. They need to be encouraged to embrace their language and build confidence. The skills are definitely transferable, but they are embarrassed. I tell them that they are so lucky to speak Spanish because they are already speaking academic language. Yeah, so, so when we, so could our routine actually begin in that manner? So the manner would be, uh, you know, tell me about, tell me about what you know, and um, can you describe to me, you know, uh, if any of this is familiar to you, and, and how is it familiar to you? And if, um, so I, I think, you know, what we call that cross-languaging um, that you probably have read about um, is important. But of course, that takes for the educator to understand that language. And since there's so many different languages, it's hard to do that work always, that cross-languaging. But 
um, you know, if they could describe it uh, to us or, you know, bring it to our attention. Uh, so should we be asking about, you know, what do they know and, and exploring the background knowledge and their lived experiences? Absolutely. And so that's one of the very first things we want to do as we engage in text that perhaps is not, um, you know, is going to be more complicated. And we know that the narrative text is um, oftentimes, even in other languages and cultures, the way our narrative text is designed is not quite how narrative text is designed in other languages. Or uh, we know that expository text is going to have a lot of, like I said, dense concepts, like lots of information, and it's going to be challenging. So how can we break that apart uh, with a routine? So that's going to be important as well. Um, but as we um, think about this and this explicit instruction, I want to make sure that we that we never forget that we're going to have our students, you know, summarize and um, but we have to build and teach them how you even do this. Uh, and so they might need the particular words to even uh, conduct a, a summarization, right? And maybe sometimes you get it through through another modality. Maybe they draw it out through a picture and then describe it, you know, in simpler terms for themselves. Oops. There's a couple more questions, Elsa. Would you like me to ask them or to move on? Sure. Sure. Um, because this is where, where you were just discussing. One of the questions is, what's the best way to tell the difference between the content object objective and the language objective? Yeah. So when we think about, you know, the content objective, so uh, if I'm so, and I'm going to describe to you some of the studies we did. Um, and so Colleen Rudabu, while Colleen Rudabu was working on a study uh, with social studies, right, uh, we, I, I was working in studies of science. And so, and I'm going to refer you to a document that will really uh, show that. Um, so uh, we want to make sure that, um, so whether that was science or whether that was social studies or even language arts. So, um, so in social studies and in science and in language arts, you have a concept that they have to learn. And so, um, you know, uh, they had to learn, uh, you know, about chemical reactions, let's say, or they had to learn this, but we always, before we did that, we found and, you know, thought about the vocabulary that we need, they needed. We thought about what would be direct and explicit ways that we could actually have them engage and see and what were the visuals that we could use. And even in our science, and, and these were also in upper elementary and middle school years, um, we brought in read alouds <laughs> that would be related. And, and it was very interesting because even um, that we, um, I was very worried in the study because uh, you know, it was, they were, the, the schools, how they were divided would be like only one teacher taught language arts, another teacher taught science, another teacher taught social studies. And so, but so the science teacher would see all the kids of that grade level. I was like, oh my gosh, how are we going to have a treatment and control? And so it ended up the treatment would be periods one, three, and five of the school day, and the control would be periods two, four, and six. And what I want to tell you, and what's also um, is in these studies, is that it was the same teacher giving the instruction, but adding in these strategies that we were insisting were necessary for English learners. And the at the end, the children that were in the treatment following, you know, these routines and procedures and things that we had designed to be very explicit. Um, those children ended up having higher oral language proficiency and higher content knowledge. And that was even having the same teacher. So periods, let's say one, three, and five, if they were treatment, did better than periods two, four, and six. So that just goes to show you that the techniques, you know, make such a difference. And I'm going to talk to you about those two, and, and then we'll put it into the, um, into the chat box uh, for this uh, practice guide of um, that uh, teaching that academic um, language and content knowledge um, for English learners. And, and I'm going to show you kind of the recommendations from that. But that just really goes to show you that, ah, 
I'm going to, I'm going to work on this, but all the while I'm teaching this, there's new vocabulary in there. And I also want them to express themselves. And so maybe they're only able to express themselves, um, you know, in a simple sentence. And so maybe I want to help them to have some connectors so they could make a more complex sentence while we're in this classroom of science or social studies or uh, mathematics or, you know, reading and language arts. Uh, so that'll be uh, important. Elsa, Elsa, did you want one more question? Before? Sure, sure. So Susan asked, we are, yes, comma, we are working on language, yet what about the EL child's level of proficiency? Language objectives must need to take into account the EL student's proficiency. Can you talk yes. about that? Yeah. So, you know, what you're talking about there is really differentiating that instruction, right? And so it might be that some are at the beginning, like some of your students might be at a beginner stage, some of the more intermediate, and maybe you have some that are even at the advanced level. And so um, we do have to take into consideration. So we might have, oh, you know, I'm going to, you know, make sure that you're able to do this. And some of you, I want you also to be able to do this. And, or, or maybe I put them into smaller groups. And, you know, when we're working in our smaller groups with our students, then we, we, we can discuss those objectives of language. Okay, I really want to hear you use this type of sentence. Remember what your sentence structure is going to be and remember to use these vocabulary words, uh, et cetera. So you're right. Um, you do have to differentiate depending on that oral language proficiency level. And oftentimes that's hard to do if you're doing a whole group, uh, but maybe I could, you know, do, uh, you know, maybe the initial introduction and then I can move them into their collaborative groups that they're going to be working on and then go across the room and kind of guide that. Uh, instruction and give those opportunities and also, um, you know, <laughs> gather data, you know, are they using this? How are they doing using this? What more do I need to work on uh, in the language? And are they understanding that content? Um, so, and one of our teachers did so wonderful. I mean, she ended up being the teacher of the year for the whole district. It was, you know, she really took off with this and it was amazing work that, that she did. And she was such a model uh, for other teachers. So it's just wonderful when, you know, you have some educators that can just really understand this and take this off and, you know, be mentors to other teachers on how to do this because it really is, um, it, it does take a lot of practice and, you um, and, and also it takes, um, you know, spending the time uh, setting it up and, and designing that lesson. So as we get into the strategies, these are, these are the things, and this is what I want to simplify for you and I want to talk about, and then we'll, we'll be talking uh, a little bit more uh, in depth about it. So what did I want to simplify? Well, you all already do this kind of work. I know you do. But um, so we always want to uh, preview. They, so when uh, you know they're going to be reading, we want to preview that text, and we want to help them to preview that text. And and um, we have to think about um, you know how can we bring in like I already can tell because I know my students, I know their language proficiency levels, I know their reading levels, I know their vocabulary levels, right? So what am I going to do to you know bring bring this in? So. Uh, one of the things we know that's helpful for English learners if they have a chance to have that opportunity for that background knowledge, have the opportunity to have a discussion, have an opportunity to have some visuals there. But remember, the goal is that as they're reading, they're thinking and maybe they're self-questioning and having those questions and asking themselves questions. And we have to model that for them. You know, and it's almost like a think aloud, you know, as they're reading, oh, this means me thinks of, of, of this. Are we asking these types of questions to develop this active strategic reader? And then as we're summarizing, you all are wonderful at coming up, you know, with your um, different graphic organizers that you use. And what I say is, you know, we don't want like, you know, it's not about the quantity that we have, it's about the quality and using particular ones for the particular text structure. So in other words, you know, when I'm reading, you know, text that is expository, you know, I'm just going to really focus in on that main idea and helping them come to that main idea statement. And sometimes that takes like, okay, we're going to practice. I'm going to give you three choices of what you think that main idea statement is. And you create the choices, one of them being 
way too broad for the main idea. One of them being, oh, it was too narrow, too specific. And one being, oh, this one will work perfectly. And, you know, we have, we do this kind of work also in our work in, in the clinic. And it's just amazing about how you realize how, how challenging it is just to get to that right main idea. And so sometimes it takes scaffolding that and having them see, oh, let here, if I gave you these three choices, which one would you choose? Which one has too much information? Which one is too specific? And which one uh, really does encompass what would be the main idea of this uh, passage? All right. So I'm gonna um, so I'm gonna talk to you about the panel and what before I get into this next one, I'm just gonna talk to you about the strategies. And so we know the metacognitive strategies uh, include making that prediction and making that prediction before reading, right? Based upon ah, oh, let me look at the let me look at the title, let me look at some of this. Maybe you know there's some subchapters or maybe there's some pictures with uh, or illustrations, um, you know. And then let me think about like, as I'm reading, what questions should I be asking when it's this text structure, when it's this text type or versus this text type? And how am I gonna figure out the text structure? You know, what, you know, is it narrative or is it uh, expository? Does it have a problem and a solution or a cause and effect? And most, most of what we see a lot of is, you know, that problem and solution and um, in addition to uh, that cause and effect. But as we're thinking about that, how can I scaffold this? How can I help them and uh, to summarize? And how can I help them to retell? So one of the things I want to tell you, beginning on page, like if you look at the book and 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 you think about page um, one, uh, let's see what page was that on 159. So in 159, you learn from uh, Colleen Rudabu's um, inclusion in the text about scaffolding for scaffolding for our students for story retelling. And that's what I want to tell you that in everything that we do in some of one of our studies, we left out this component for comprehension, that would be that that retell of the information because we were trying to save time and we thought, do we really need to do that? How about if this time and this study, we don't do that and we just get to these other, well, we learned a lesson. The students didn't come out with as much uh, gain as they did in the other studies. And that's because that retail, what does that tell you? That retail is so important because it tells, first of all, it's a great language opportunity. That retelling is a wonderful language opportunity, but it's also a, an opportunity for you to understand, right? For you to understand what, what are they taking away from this? And for you to understand where are they in this comprehension of what they've read and then getting this, you know, main idea and details or really understanding if it was narrative, you know, the characters and, and, and some of the issues or, or, and problems around that. But what we know is also, uh, if you think about um, the, um, what works clearinghouse and you think about national reading panel it always says working collaboratively and having the opportunity for that retelling and reviewing but also we've talked about and what dr rodebrew brings in too is that being what we call that culturally responsive teaching and making sure that oh can we can i have any text here that's also going to bring in maybe you know different cultures and really expand that world knowledge or making it more connected to them and to their uh, and relevant to them, something that they can connect to. So as we think about this, I've talked to you about uh, Colleen Rudabu's work and um, at, at the University of Texas at Austin and uh, the work that I did at the University of Houston. And you can read about our work at the Teaching Academic Content and Literacy to English Learners in Elementary and Middle School. It's the Institute for Education Science Practice Guide. And we've referred to this before and they've put it in the chat with the link. And it's so simple to read, but I want to describe to you. So from what, you know, what we did, you know, Colleen worked on the social studies while we were working on the science studies. And um, after reviewing thousands of studies, there was only 14 studies that made it into the IES practice guide. And so what do we have strong 
evidence for that teaching that set of academic vocabulary words, but teaching it intensively across several days using a variety of instructional activities that that promotes the language, the vocabulary and the content knowledge right and so we have some very strong evidence that and we've replicated um, those studies, you know, so we didn't only do one study, you know, we did it over several years with different cohorts. Number two, the strong evidence for integrating oral and written English language instruction in the content area. And so what I was telling you is, right, we want listening, speaking, reading, and writing, no matter what we're doing. I'm teaching math, I'm teaching science, I'm teaching social studies, I'm teaching reading and language arts, right? So making sure that we have those intentional opportunities for listening, speaking, reading, and writing. And like I told you, in those science classrooms, even if they were upper, we brought in read alouds uh, to that would really be related to the science concepts that they were reading and that could really enhance and give them pictures also to visualize, you know, the concepts that they were learning. All right. And what we'd have minimal evidence for, not enough research in this area about those structured opportunities for written language skills. I'm assuming that this is going to be changed once there's been enough studies, but there weren't enough studies to really um, you know, come to that conclusion for the Institute for Education Sciences. And then the moderate evidence is that small group instructional intervention to students that are struggling in areas of literacy and English language development. So, you know, you were describing earlier the questions that you asked, you were describing earlier, um, oh, by the way, um, you know, what if you have different levels of oral language proficiency? And I'm telling you, yeah, you're right. It's hard to do this whole group, but can I have an opportunity within my instruction to create those small groups and, and really help the students in this area of developing their language, their literacy and their content knowledge uh, in doing that. All right, any comments on the IES practice guides? Okay, no questions on that? All right, so now what I wanna tell you, so if we think about the National Literacy Panel Report and the National Literacy Panel Report for Language Minority Children, and also what we've learned about, you know, English learners and across the content areas, I wanna share with you a real simple way to think about all these evidence-based practices and, and, what, and, and kind of like an acronym to help you design your lessons, all right? Um, and so um, that is called, and what I call it is um, 3PV3RQ, all right? 3PV3RQ. And um, by the way, I just thought of this, <laughs> not in your handouts. So, you know, I just thought about it. I go, you know, I should just share, you know, what we do. Uh, it's not in the book. Uh, I, I did write about it in the multi-sensory teaching of basic language skills book, which is a book by Dr. Judith Birch and Dr. Suzanne Carriker. And, and um, uh, I wrote chapter 20. All right. So, when we look at this 3PV3RQ and we think about the evidence-based practices and we think about what I've been talking about today. So if I could design my lessons and make sure that I'm doing these things. So as we talked about, first of all, to help me with my attention, my focusing, my goals, you're going to talk to me about the purpose, the purpose of what you're, what, you know, this lesson is going to be about and what are my, you know, what am I going to be learning and what are going to be my goals. Uh, and so we start with the purpose, uh, uh, with the purpose in mind, and that really helps students to, you know, hone in. And then, um, you remember I was talking to you about building that background knowledge and figuring out their lived experiences and figuring out their culture and linguistic responsive teaching. This is where I can prepare those connections, right? What, what about this can they connect to and how can I explore that background knowledge? And so I'm gonna pre prepare something that they can make a connection to. 
And then as you heard, and as you read about in this chapter, you know, those predictions that, you know, making predictions based upon perhaps, you know, uh, the title, perhaps the subtitles, perhaps uh, some of the visuals there, perhaps, uh, um, you know, some of the previous reading and, uh, you know, what can they predict about this? And then remember, we talked about, hmm, what about the vocabulary? You know, my goal is for them to comprehend and what are some target words within this passage that are going to be necessary to explore in depth. And one of the things I want to talk to you about that we overlook for English learners, and, and many of you have read, you know, the books of, you know, Dr. Um, Isabel Beck and, and McCallan and Kukin, who came up with the concept of tier one words, common everyday words, tier two words, uh, academic words with high, what we call utility and generalizability, or tier three words, um, words that, um, uh, words that are, academic words and you know high level words but they're very specific to a particular topic and um and don't have as high what we call utility or generalizability right but sometimes you have to do those tier three words because you have to have those to master the content of this you know like for example science words and some of them are very useful and some of them are too specific but as we think about the vocabulary for the english learner what i want to tell you and what we've learned is that uh don't assume that they even know all those basic words. And sometimes those basic words, the tier one words, um, can be words that have multiple, multiple meanings. And they may not know uh, the meaning in particular for this content, this context that they'll be reading. So, um, and I give an example of like a simple word like run, R-U-N, and that's a simple common everyday word, but perhaps in the text it might mean many different things. And when I do this exercise with teachers, you know, I came up with 45 meanings of run. And so, uh, you know, they may know maybe one, two meanings, maybe three, but do they know the meaning in depth? And so when Isabel Beck talks about the the breadth of words, you know, having knowing a lot of words versus also knowing them in depth. So, you know, that's something, you know, don't assume that they know all those tier one words also, those basic words, but you very definitely are going to get to the academic words. So that was my three P's and the V. Look over to um, the right side of your screen and you'll see the R for reading. And so we're going to prepare them for that reading, right? And uh, we're going to make sure that they can, you know, read it strategically. And uh, so it might be that it maybe takes more than one read uh, to really get at the gist of what they're reading. Um, you know what, I'm going to switch around. Uh, I don't want, I, I would rather do the review before the retell. So let's switch that around if you would, please. And the reason I prefer the review before the retell, retell is that then I'm modeling to them, you know, what I'm taking away as, you know, the very key points of the text that they've read. So let's do the review before we have them, because that's almost like the model and the practice for them before we set them loose to do the retell right? Uh, so I'll review with them what's in the passage, what, you know, they've learned, uh, what they should have come away with. And then that's almost like me modeling the retail. Uh, and then they get to retell with a partner. And then when we think about, you know, the questioning, you know, we want to make sure, of course, that we're getting at the simple and complex questions. But one of the things that we know about from uh, from the work, uh, you know, the body of research is question generation. It's not only question answering, it's question generation. And the question generation really should, and, 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 and once you get into these routines, the students start to use this and it becomes almost like a metacognitive strategy for them. But that question generation, and I often make them answer questions, generate questions of the how and the why and the what if, and, you know, could we compare or contrast, getting to just, you know, very 
much higher level. And so I try to design my lessons, really incorporating all that we've learned through the body of research, through our work and others, and really kind of make this acronym 3PV3RQ for remembering, you know, what to do and how to design uh, the lessons. Okay, so, um, so what are some ways, uh, Colleen Rudabu wrote these uh, questions, uh, in what ways can you build English learners um, background knowledge? We, let's, we can have a discussion. What have you tried? What has worked for you um, that has been very helpful? Somebody wanna share? Um, what I'm seeing is uh, folks are writing videos, images. Oh, gosh, you know what? I am so glad that you brought that up. I'm embarrassed that I didn't. I mean, of course we did that. And so quick little videos. Oh, my gosh. Yes, that's evidence based. Yes, we did that. And yes, it works. Thank you for bringing that up. My goodness. Absolutely. Yes. And especially when it's abstract things, right? And, and so th that would be really great. Yeah. yeah, we see word splash, KWL chart, songs and chants, dialogic reading. Yeah. Um, okay. real, realia. Yeah, so bringing in, mm -hmm. you know, actual things. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you for bringing that all up. That was fantastic. So... You know, one of the things uh, Colleen Rudabu was asking is, how do you and how can you support English learners transition from their use of their primary language to English? And some of you were talking about using it very strategically, right? Uh, for um, really, you know, having the opportunity to demonstrate what they know in their language. Um, but we also want them to demonstrate what they know in the second language. So, um, you know, how can you support that for the students? Ideas? Brain pop. And I'll wait more for more to come into it. It's just a quick one. I was gonna say, I see illustrated picture books, dialogic reading, okay. um, Google images. Yes. Yes. And then not only having the Google images and uh, but it's also having a discussion around that and around those images. And we, we do that a lot. And especially for those abstract concepts, we give examples and things that are examples and non-examples, right? What it is and what it isn't. Uh, and then getting the opportunity once again for that discussion. And then we get to model, right? We're modeling, you know, they can use their language and then but one of the things I always talked about is making sure we get those complete sentences, even if you're at the beginning stages of learning, you know, English as your second language, how can we get them to give a complete sentence? And we're going to work on that, even if it's a complete, simple sentence. And so this gives us the opportunity to work on that too. And bringing that in was wonderful. I'm seeing um, sentence frames and sentence starters. Yes. And Jamboard. Um, TPR. Total physical response. Thank you. And um, quick draw or quick write. Yeah. Yeah. That quick draw and quick write is wonderful. All right. So in your instructional day, where can you add time for students to practice their language skills and their literacy skills with their peers? How do you do that? How do you manage that? Because we know they're more willing to risk and to take risk if it's a smaller group. I see um, flip, Flipgrid. Okay. Um, Kagan Cooperative Learning Strategies, Oracy Activities, Sentence Frames, um, Volunteers for a Language Table at Lunch. Oh, yes. Um, turn and talk. 
can I tell you something? Can I can I elaborate on can I elaborate on that turn and talk? Can yes, I, please. With you guys. Okay, so um, so you know, so we talk about I call it the four T's. All right. So let's think about that. And uh, so the four T's are to first think. So our English learners need think time because they're thinking in a a second language and they may be thinking in their native language and kind of you know translating you know we think and we think in our home language and then we translate and come out with it in the second language and at some point then we don't do that anymore and we can think in the english language right um uh so so i say think right so that's my first t you have to think you know and, and really kind of organize what you're going to say then you turn you're turning to your partners and then you talk, right? You tell, and then what I want, I add another T to that and think of the think, turn, talk. And the next T is the tell. And what I want to happen next is I want them to report back to the whole group. So they're going to tell back to us and, and they had their practice time in the, in the small group and then they come back and then that gives me as the instructor some time um, to, um, uh, to some time to really, if I didn't have time to go all around the groups, it gives me some time to another opportunity for them to practice their language, another opportunity to, for me to take in the data of what they're giving me and realize what do they know, what don't they know, how's their language here, how's their content knowledge as we go through that. So think, turn, talk, and then come back and tell it to the entire group. So as we think about vocabulary acquisition, um, you know, and its importance to reading comprehension and why is it especially important for English learners? And I think we could add a, a little something more uh, to that. Um, so let's think about, you know, that vocabulary acquisition for reading comprehension. And when I taught, when we talked last week about the fluency Remember what I what what mediates comprehension is oral language proficiency. Any any comments on that? Um, yes, uh, so, uh, we have someone who said our high school classes are sheltered and size capped. Um, so classes are a secure place for all students to feel uh, brave and comfortable. That's nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they get that opportunity and they can risk take, not as, you know, threatening. Yes. So as you think about some of the things that we discussed tonight, are there some routines that you could incorporate for your English learners? reading comprehension. So I'd like for you to share some of that. Any, any feedback on that? Um, I'm seeing um, Carrie is said um, beyond vocabulary, um, just using some sentence activities um, so that students know how words in a sentence are related to one another. Uh -huh. Very good. Yes, thank you. With some adaptations to regular teaching routines, all teachers are capable of providing high quality reading comprehension instruction that leads English learners to achieving rigorous standards. In other words, you know, we're not going, we, we, we still want to have the high expectations and keep to our standards, but bring in these routines um, and always be thinking about language proficiency, vocabulary, and the comprehension, and, you know, making sure that we're teaching them these metacognitive skills to get to that deep comprehension. And we know that we can achieve that. And we've demonstrated it in our studies um, with children uh, across many years. And, you know, it is possible, but it has to be very well planned 
and uh, intentional and become a routine. Okay, so how are we doing? <laughs> Any other comments, questions, things, reflections? Like yeah. We did have just one earlier. Um, the message was, um, thank you, Dr. Elsa, for inspiring me. Um, and I think we're getting a lot of those types of messages. Oh, so. okay. <laughs> thank you. You're, you're welcome. And I'm, I, I, I might um, see if, you know, um, Dr. Redderbrook, she can join us at another time. We'll, we'll check and see where maybe like some question answer or something like that. Uh, we'll see. There was a quick question, Elsa. Uh, can you give me an example of some routines? Yeah. So remember, so even that 3PV, 3RQ is a routine. And so guess what happens when you do that routine? The students already know, I'm going to learn about the purpose, or I need to be thinking about what the purpose is, right? Uh, I'm going to really think about, I'm, I'm going to have an opportunity to talk about background knowledge. Oh, I got to know about these vocabulary. But guess what? We want the students to be able to do that as they're reading. Okay, what is the purpose of this, right? Are there some vocabulary words that I don't know and I need to explore and learn better, right? And I need to ask about or look up or, you know, um, you know, do a quick check online. Um, and then as I'm reading, am I really figuring out the text structure, right? And am I thinking, oh, okay, this is expository. I need to be thinking about the main ideas, some details here, or am I looking for the problem and solution or the cause and effect? Here's some target words that I'm looking for that will give me, you know, kind of the gist of, yeah, I think it's going to be this because these are some of those words that are in there. And then, oh, I know that there's going to be some questions that I have to answer, but I also know that I'm going to have to generate some questions to think beyond the text, right? And so, um, but what ends up happening is as we do this and as we keep following this routine that embeds all these co uh, comprehension strategies that are evidence-based, the students start to think about that and they start to read like that and think in these routines. And so the more that you do that, you're giving them this metacognitive strategy about what they're supposed to be doing as they read. And that's what the beauty is. You're setting them free to do this on their own by all the practice that you'll be doing with them. Okay, Elsa, Elsa, I had one more and was just to expand on TPR. I, oh, okay. I'm sure everybody knows what that is. So total physical response. So here we go. Ready? Are you ready? All right, that multiple meanings for run. <laughs> and I'm not going to show you uh, diarrhea run. <laughs> I got the runs. <laughs> or run amok. <laughs> Wild and crazy. Uh, so, yeah, so I'm going to use those crazy and wild. You don't know me, but I'm really kind of silly. And, um, but anyway, I will do anything for a child to really understand. And so uh, we act them out, we role play, we, you know, use like some of you were talking about, we might have a very abstract concept. We might, you know, give in some examples, like, you know, one of them for, for example, in one of our projects called the sale project, it was things like miraculous, right? You know, you know or a, it was a miracle. And so we brought in things like, you know, you know, like simple things like, you know, here was this little, um, you know, sea turtle <laughs> that was surviving because they, they're going extinct or here's this beautiful flower, you know, isn't it a miracle how, you know, flowers grow and just all the different types of examples that we can come up with. Uh, and then also the things that it's not like, oh, you know, that word content and, and, and how, um, you know, here's a friendly definition, happy and satisfied, but, um, you know, what can it mean when you're not happy and satisfied? Let's give some examples. Let me give you visuals. Let me act it out. Um, so that's what we need. But that, yeah, that total physical response is uh, something that we know with the visuals that is very helpful for English learners. I, no, I know Elsa, Elsa is a busy lady tonight. She has to uh, leave a little bit early because she's going to another presentation in like one minute. Uh, there was a question about if there's any decent classroom uh, videos that model these things that they could look at, but um, you can send that to us and we'll put it on the tablet because I don't want you to be late. She's actually starting another presentation. Uh, poor Colleen could not be here this evening and another, uh, she's kind of pinch for another colleague in just about a minute. So, one minute. Um, 
and they're already saying, where are you? Where are you? <laughs> yeah. So, so thank you. It's been a, a, it's been a wonderful, and I'm so sorry that uh, Dr. Bradabu couldn't join us this evening, but I, I um, hope that uh, you got some benefit from, um, you know, tuning in this evening. So thank Most you all. Thank, thank you, you Elsa. <laughs> See you next That's Thursday. Awesome. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Elsa. Oh my goodness. Imagine that <laughs> from this one to that one. So thank you all so very, very much again, uh, again for being here. Uh, next week, we'll be uh, digging into spelling development with uh, Dr. Cardenas Hagen and Alessandra Rico. I will launch the poll now. Make sure you complete it before you leave and we'll see you next Thursday. It'll be here before you know it. Thanks as well to my colleagues, Lisa Bola and Amy Cavalier for joining me tonight. Really appreciate it. Oh, they're coming in fast and furious tonight. <laughs> 122 already. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. We really appreciate you spending Thursday nights with us. <laughs>